What I will do first before we sort of get into the, the talk is to give you just a quick video for all of you who don't know Poshmark or sort of may have a certain impression of Poshmark. Just give you like a one or two minute video on what is Poshmark and then we'll start sort of with the closet and make cash while you do it. Poshmark is the number one way to buy and sell fashion. List anything from shoes that don't quite fit to a dress you've been photographed in one too many times in just 60 seconds. Ready to find all the styles you love? On Poshmark, discovering the perfect look is simple and fun. Love your purchase? Leave the seller a love note to let them know. Join millions of people across the country who are buying, selling, and sharing fashion they love. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is sort of something that isn't talked about as much, which is love and how it impacts the growth of your business. I understand a lot of you are engineering students and I'm at one day I was sort of one myself, which was uh, studying computer science. But today sort of what we are doing is really helping in a broad sense, people sell shoes and clothes across the country. And so I'm going to share a little bit about my journey from being a database nerd, a computer science graduate, to sort of for the last 10, 12 years building shopping communities, uh, particularly centered around fashion. Uh, and today, Poshmark is actually going beyond fashion into other areas uh, as well. So before uh, we get started, let me share a little bit about myself. So I grew up in India. I was there. For the first 19 years of my life, I came here in 87 when I was 19 years old. I grew up primarily in multiple different cities. And I think uh, part of what shaped me was the fact that as I had to move from city to city, I had to adapt and quickly sort of respond to changing climates. If you can imagine as a kid moving from school to school constantly, it was kind of a trauma. A byproduct of that was for some reason, I got to skip a couple of grades. So I finished high school when I was 15, which was both good and bad. In some ways, it sort of sounds interesting, but you're know, trying to then leave home and go to a different city and get into a college and try to study. I mean, how, how many of you are freshmen here? Any freshmen? So if you can imagine being a freshman at 15 and having come to a school and, and living away from your town, it was kind of a crazy time. And, uh, and there was a lot of learnings there. But, uh, but that was sort of the foundation that was created, which was growing up in these, uh, in these small towns. And part of what that trained me for was flexibility, which is being able to adapt to different circumstances, which has been a little bit of my journey throughout my career. Uh, as, as Ravi mentioned, I went to a school called IIT Kanpur, uh, which was in India. And, um, and that was kind of an interesting process too, because I actually didn't know what school I was going to go to, because I was only 13 when I was thinking about colleges. Uh, and then sort of suddenly realized that I wanted to go to this very specific school called IIT Kanpur, which had this computer science program. And they only took 15 students every year in this program. And I told my dad, either I'm going to go to this program, I'm going to sit out a year. And uh, he said, are you crazy? You got to apply to more schools than this one school. And I said, no, it's, that's the only school I want to go to. 
So he forced me to apply to a couple other schools, but I was sort of very hyper-focused on getting into this, this program. And the way that the admissions process works is you get ranked. And, uh, and based on your ranking, you get to select which school you get to. So there's like six or seven IITs. There's more now. So I got, I think my rank was like 41 or 43, which typically would not get you into that school, uh, which typically would get you to, into a different school. But somehow that year, one, two, three, four, five ranks chose to go to a different IIT. So I was the 15th student admitted. So I think some of my life has been shaped by good luck as well, where serendipity and good luck and, uh, and focus sort of get you into these things. Anyway, it was a great experience, uh, learned a lot. Uh, and from there, I came to Texas and went to UT Austin as sort of doing, I uh, enrolled for a PhD program, but after a while decided that that was sort of not a journey that I wanted to pursue. So I took a master's, dropped out, and moved to the Valley and, uh, and joined Intel. And my first job was actually building database software for storing semiconductor data. And there used to be a job like that in 89 because there was no professional databases at that time. Things like Oracle and MongoDB and SQL did not actually exist. So we were still hand cobbling databases in those days. Uh, after a year, I realized that that was not something I wanted to do. So I looked around and found that I wanted to really work for a database company and moved across the bay to Berkeley to work for a company at that time called Sybase. And uh, when I was at Intel, Intel had, I, I think, eight to 10,000 employees. So my next job was with uh, a company which had only 80 employees at that time. <laughs> Accidentally, without realizing, I joined a startup. And uh, that was the good part. The bad part, for those of you who are familiar with startups, was we were in 1990. We were going through a mad, bad recession in Silicon Valley. And Sybase was not able to raise a round of funding so they had bridge capital when I joined, and they just laid off 10% of their workforce. And uh, fortunately for me, I was not savvy to any of these topics. I was very excited about living in Berkeley and working for a database technology that was really, really sophisticated and sort of gave me the learning that I wanted to do. And so what happened was within a year, the recession turned around. The company grew. By the time I left it five years later, we were 6,000 people. We had filed, we'd, we'd become public. We were one of the top database companies. And to me, the moral of that story was really, again, around pursuing what you love and focus on. When you sort of do things in a very calculated way, in a top-down way, it may work out, it may not work out. In this case, I was just pursuing something that I wanted to do more from the perspective of what I loved and that is sort of how my entire career has shaped out, including starting the two companies. It hasn't been, oh, I want to start a company in collaborative consumption or, or something. It's just sort of organically evolved in the process. And so I was there at Cybis for a long time, and then I realized that the company had become too big for me. So then I joined another company called Versada, which had a couple of ex Cybase people, and it had only eight employees at that time. Now, we were in a completely different world in that company. We were building applications for Microsoft platforms. And this was 95. And the world was shifting towards the first wave of internet. And at that point in time, what ended up happening was that as, as the world was shifting towards internet, we had to pivot. And actually, Professor Byers, if he's in the room, I was taking his class right before that time and learning about concepts called crossing the chasm, focusing, et cetera. And as this neophyte MBA at this company, I was trying to persuade the CEO to apply those concepts and was failing. But ultimately, some of those things helped me in a way because we had to put all of our energies in moving away from the Microsoft Windows platform and moving to internet back in 98, 99. So, so that, that was sort of a time of, I would call, extreme learning, where we were in a company that was going through a major, what we would call pivot today, where we had to actually go through firing off half the company to go through that pivot. But then we grew from there and actually went public in 2000. And the company went from eight to over 600, 700 people. And that was sort of my first state of success where I really was there from the beginning and, and grew the company. But as I was exiting the company, we hit the second recession in Silicon Valley, which was around 0102 that I experienced where things were really bad. It's probably the worst I've seen in the 30 years in Silicon Valley. And that allowed and forced us to all reinvent ourselves. So I had to focus on reinventing myself from being an engineer. And I, I actually took on the role of an investment banker at that point in time. And what I was doing was really merge, uh, introducing companies together. 
And through that process, I was able to connect two companies that one company ended up acquiring another company. And in that process, it became a new company and invited me to join. When I joined that company, I realized that this area that the specific area they're working was not my passion. So I took all of that, and my wife is here, and we took all of that and applied that passion into remodeling our home. In that remodeling, I discovered a lot of problems that they were around collaboration, around shopping. This was back in 2003, 2004. And from there emerged my first company. But as the idea was forming, I kept telling myself, you know, I'm not the right guy to do this because I know everything about enterprise software, building systems, databases. I know nothing about consumer behavior. I know absolutely nothing about advertising. I know nothing about collaborative models or web or internet from an outside in perspective. So I kept rejecting the idea. But progressively that idea became all consuming and it, everything felt like a nail. So it felt like I could solve world hunger with this little thing around social collaboration, a tool that I was building, which was called Caboodle at that point in time. And part of what I did was, and this is sort of how I approach problems, is creating the necessary preconditions for success. And I would sort of, again, give you a piece of thought is that wherever you're going, beyond sort of the journey you're taking in terms of the schooling you're getting, et cetera, if a direction you want to get to Trying to create the right preconditions for success is very important. So for me, that preconditions came by actually becoming a volunteer in several different local organizations and taking and, and focusing my energy in connecting with people who really know what internet was. So I connected with the alums you know, from IIT, from Berkeley, et cetera, and, and, and brought them into sort of connection. Met with a couple of my professors who were teaching here at Stanford, a couple of the guys who were involved in Google in the early days, but also created a group of internet luminaries who were just starting out at that time. So through that, I met with Reid Hoffman, Joe Krause, a bunch of people who I would not have met through in my normal sort of process. Brought them all together, created a think tank, which was good for them, but I was also learning through that process and, and meeting folks. And so that was sort of some of the preconditions I created before Caboodle was getting born. As Caboodle started, we really started in a garage, physically in a garage, and very soon we realized that the real true product market fit for that product was around women's shopping and women's community. And so by honing it on that sort of very specific thing, it was easy to find that market fit. However, when I went to my board, my advisors, everyone asked me a simple question, which was, how can shopping be social? Now, you have to remember, this was 2005, and I'm a 51, tomorrow, 51-year-old man, and at that time, I was sitting in a room of 40-year-old men, and for them, shopping being social was very counterintuitive. And so we had to take a risk to really move this thing in the world of social shopping as we were going from a general-purpose collaboration tool. Fortunately, we did. And the market adoption, and, and we made everything sort of public and super social. This was circa 05, 06. Even the term social shopping when we launched the product in 06 was counterintuitive. We had to explain what is social shopping. I remember going to TechCrunch at Michael Arrington's office and trying to explain to him you know, what does social even mean in context of shopping. Social was somewhat of a paradigm, but social shopping was kind of an oxymoron in those days. And, uh, and that's how sort of the caboodle journey began. And the company sort of grew very fast in the first couple of years, but it was still early days. The monetization wasn't there. And in 07, we were looking at two options. We had a term sheet from SoftBank and we had an acquisition offer from Hearst. Fortunately for us, we actually ended up selling to Hearst at that point in time and became part of Hearst Magazine's and Hearst Interactive. I say fortunately because after that, 08 and 09 happened. And 08 and 09 was another sort of recession. Fortunately, this time I was sitting in a very different situation where we were actually scaling and growing very fast at that period of time. And this journey of five or six years with Caboodle became my, how many of you have read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour sort of metaphor? So Malcolm Gladwell has this book where he talks a little bit about the fact that to really specialize or grow skills in some areas, you have to spend at least 10,000 hours practicing it, right? And so through this five years, this 10,000 hours that I spent in this journey transformed me from being just a database geek to now knowing about community, fashion, working with sort of a community which was predominantly women, and then marrying technology and sort of these things together. So as I came out of this company and finished my contract with Hearst, 
I wanted to do something which mirrored these two things. And the big insight I had was that when we think of really creating a shopping platform which is focused around discovery paradigms, fashion, style, et cetera, the scale that we'd been able to achieve in 2009, 2010 was very small. And a lot of it was gated by the fact that people were really trying to do everything in a very structured algorithmic way. And a lot of fashion and style is a serendipity discovery. So the first thesis we had going into this sort of whole problem was that we wanted to build something that was really powered by people. And the second thing which was there, which was happening in 09, 010 was iPhone was just starting to come of age. And, uh, and I say iPhone because that was the only mobile product worth using at that time. And so mobile was just starting to come of age. And that really led to sort of the, the creation of Poshmark. And uh, what sort of clicked in my mind was I was on a vacation and one of my friends had an iPhone 4, which was about this big, but it was the first phone which had very high resolution camera and very high resolution screen. And he was able to take a photo, immediately upload it to Facebook where I was with my SLR trying to take a photo, get the chip out, shove it into the laptop and trying to get it in. I said, this is revolutionary right now. And right around that time, I discovered a little app called Instagram, which had this notion of something called filters. And I said, between these two things, we've suddenly empowered the consumer to really create a dynamic fashion magazine. And in 09, when we had the early idea of Poshmark, we were thinking it'll be a set of fashion magazines that would connect people to buy and sell. So in 10, with this platform, it became clear that this may be the right way to think about it. The challenge was the world was not ready for it. None of the investors at that time really believed that mobile will be the place where people would shop. So everyone was trying to convince me, why don't you just use it as a selling tool but really create a website around shopping? And for me, that felt very antithetical to sort of the whole circular paradigm. So the one big bet we made, which was sort of the insight, was that everything will be done on this phone. So we really focused on just one thing, which was to build an end-to-end -end app around this area. Prior to sort of even starting Poshmark, one of the preconditions for starting Poshmark was when we started Caboodle, it was three guys. All of us came from technology background because, again, my network were sort of confined to Silicon Valley. So for Poshmark or sort of for the next journey, I said, you know, I have an amazing network of people from technology. I understand product and all of that but I wanted to systematically bring in a partner, a co-founder, who came deep from fashion world. And so I actually spent the first half of 2010, even before this epiphany around the, uh, the, the phone happened, really trying to figure out who that right founder would be, and met actually several people who grew up in the fashion business in New York and LA who were here, and finally met my co-founder, Tracy, through Mayfield, who was one of the people who introduced me and connected to her, and we really ended up sort of really sort of feeling compatible in terms of how our values, what our, our shared vision was about the future. And then two of the other co-founders, Gotham and Chetan in Poshmark, were actually with me in Caboodle days. Both were CTO and VP of Engineering, which is the role that they play here. And that's how sort of the initial team for Poshmark came together. But there was a fifth missing piece because Poshmark is very much powered around community. And so to get that community element, I actually went back to Caboodle and reconnected with the person who worked in a very different role with me in, in Caboodle and recruited her. And she didn't even know that she was actually really good at it, but I saw the potential in her to bring her on as our head of community. And the five of us were able to start Poshmark, again, back to the garage days. Uh, initial funding came from Mayfield and bet sort of the farm on creating an end-to-end -end platform on that little device called iPhone 4 at that time. Now, it seems like amazing, you know, sort of serendipity-wise, you know, mobile should have meant everything. In 2010, 2011, it was a huge risk. In fact, I remember going to at least a dozen different investors up and down Sand Hill, and everyone saying, you know, yeah, we like it, but the conversion rates are much higher on the web, so you should definitely launch a website. We actually didn't launch a website till two years later, and actually only beginning of last year did our website actually match up to industry standards. And Web is actually a growth engine for us in the last 18 months, almost reverse, because the first five years were all mobile for us. Uh, 
the, the, the beauty of that was that we built everything so everything happened on the phone, which today people are trying to get to, and we sort of started there, and that ended up being a huge competitive advantage over the long term. What I did not know, which happened in the Caboodle days, but also happened in the Poshmark days, was as we were starting the company, there were at least 70 to 80 other guys who were trying to do the same thing. Seven years later, what's interesting about our space is not the fact that Poshmark is growing and scaling and winning, but that there is actually probably eight or 10 other companies who are doing pretty well in this space. And the whole space is actually very well formed at this point, driving a lot of growth in how fashion is being bought and sold, not just in the United States, but across the world. And that is something which I don't think I could have predicted even at that journey is how the entire sort of behavior of the consumer will massively shift. However, what we did from day one was put in a couple of core principles in place that have guided the growth of the platform. And the first for, for our business was really focusing on love. By that, what I mean is focusing on engagement. And so if you're building anything in the consumer space, I would say the number one thing to focus on is engagement. Even though everyone will tell you to focus on growth, growth comes, but engagement is something that is not easy to sort of get or invent. So for us, the very first version of the product got the consumers very deeply engaged, and that was an early sign of success where people were and are spending somewhere between 20 to 25 minutes a day on the app, and they open the app seven to nine times a day. And most people will activate as both buyer and seller, which makes the process of building a marketplace much easier because you don't have to focus on supply or demand simultaneously. So where we are today is we have little over 40 million community members growing at the rate of 40, 50% a year in terms of just the sheer community. They continue to remain engaged. So every single user who's joined the platform continues to sort of scale up in its engagement and spend <coughs> levels. We have roughly about $100 million worth of inventory that's uploaded on a weekly basis. What's really interesting is one of the architectures we created was mutual sharing of love. So the platform is built around the fact that each user has to build a set of followers, which is not in counterintuitive to all of you, you know, because you're familiar with social platforms, you have to build this set of followers. What's counterintuitive is that all your items are primarily seen by just your followers. So which means in order to grow your business, you have to not just build a network of followers, you have to engage with other people. And what the follower sees is all the items that are being shared by the people that he or she is following. So you have to actually share not just your own items, but items that other people list in order to build your network. So in that sense, it behaves like a social network. So we're probably the only marketplace where every seller spends roughly half their time promoting other sellers' items. Now, if you think about it for a second, how counterintuitive is that? How many people know a marketplace where every seller spends half their time promoting other sellers? But they don't do it because they are just sort of in the world of being good to other people. They do it because they also want to grow. However, this sort of this particular metaphor, and by the way, this metaphor was an accident in the sense that the curation was very deliberate to get people to curate each other's items. But this interaction and engagement, that observation only happened later on as to how it was facilitating as an extreme expediter of community development because you had to engage with other people. And what that does is it allows us to continue to sort of build the system without having to do all kinds of retention and sort of proactively going out and other pieces. Now, when you think about people sharing each other's items, there is a wisdom into it. Because as you share other people's items, you actually become more and more savvy as a stylist. So we call our seller, seller stylist. Also, it prevents us from introducing things like advertising because we can't. The, the main focus is around sharing. So which keeps the core of the community very pure. And so one of our first core values that we've created in the platform is all around putting the consumer first, right? So when you think about the seller and the buyer, because they are the same, and because they have to focus on other people, and those people have to focus on other people, the core of the community is centered around people. So our entire shopping platform is not built on products, 
but on focusing on people. And I remember in 2010, standing in a cafe on University Avenue, and three or four of us were sitting there, and we just had this epiphany that Poshmark is all about people. And that is still true. And we all gave us a, each other a big hug because the entire product design centered around that sort of single concept of people. What was beautiful is that it also allows us to design a company architecture. So, for example, at Poshmark today, everyone who joined in the first two and a half years of the company, every single employee is still here with the company. And they are still scaling and growing with the company. Many of them are senior executives, many of them are leaders in the, in the group. But part of it is not just me putting people first, but everyone sort of putting people first. And that has created a culture which, you know, obviously takes a lot of effort and we are going through as we are scaling at different places to continue to challenge it. But it creates an amazing culture, which particularly when you live in Silicon Valley, to have that longevity across all, all types of folks is very hard to do. You can only do it if you can walk the walk and talk the talk and, and sort of blend the two things. So it allows us to dovetail community and company paradigms into, into a single sort of uh, approach. The second thing is we created a partnership with our community where we do not make any money off our community. We only make money when our community makes money. Now think about that for a second. If you are in the business of advertising, you're actually asking people to pay something, whether they make money or not, right? If you have a service fee, you're actually asking people to pay a service fee, whether they make money or not, right? Imagine if Stanford changed its entire tuition system to say, we'll only be taking 5% of your future earnings and nothing today, right? They would actually be in a different position. It'd be a very radically different approach, provided you signed up for it, right? So we did that. From day one, we said, hey, seller, anybody who sells on the platform, we'll have an 80-20 partnership with you. You keep 80% of revenue, we keep 20%. And that's it. There's going to be no other fees ever beyond that. You'll never pay any payment processing fee, any shipping fee, any overweight fee, any chargeback, fraud, anything else. No listing fees, nothing. So we did that in 2011. In 2018, we have the exact same fee structure. If you think of seven years in any marketplace, any single marketplace you can pick up, if you look at the number of times they've changed the fees, it would be at least three to six. Whether you think of Amazon, eBay, Etsy, Uber, any of the sort of marketplaces. And part of the thing was it, was a, it felt a little heavy early on that people said, oh, 20% is a lot. But the reason we did that is we could provide every single service and never have to go back and touch that fee structure, right? So we could lead and focus on love and money comes. And money is sort of always a second order process. So we can focus on really delivering the highest value. And that guides us from day one, is we are in the service of our seller stylist, of our community. And we don't have to worry about anything else. Everything else just gets taken care of in the process. So we always grow with our community. We cannot grow outside them because we don't make any money if they don't make any money. We just recently announced we've distributed over a billion dollars to our seller side. It's distributed, not just our revenue. So it excludes our fees and everything else. And that is a great milestone because in their success lies our success. And it never sort of disconnects ever at all. The, the third thing which is around this sort of love is very, very critical because if you have that as a core thing, then you can allow and scale the platform without having to corrupt it, right? And over time, one of the challenges that happens is when those things become, when love and money gets disconnected and you start to become a public company or whatever, all these pressures start to take you down into dark alleys, right? And it's taken a lot of work up front. The first three, four years were super hard. But as you're scaling by coinciding these two pieces, you can create something really, really hard. So my sort of core takeaway from this is, as you go through your journeys in life, you know, obviously you're very young and as you sort of evolve, as your own value systems get clearer, think of how you can create products and services that can be meaningful, have economically sound foundations. So we didn't give away the product for free, we charged 20% partnership. But over the long term, it becomes very symbiotic and synergistic with what you want to do, right? And that, you're clarifying around what your value systems are, what you're trying to do is very, very powerful. But then being able to build products and services that you can symbolize is even more critical. And particularly with the amazing opportunity that all of you have 
and the amazing opportunities that this valley gives you in terms of uh, growth, I think the responsibility that we have to society is at an all-time high, right? And so we have to be able to level up to that responsibility and combine it and integrate with all the amazing opportunity and successes that all of you are going to achieve. And so one of the beautiful parts of working at Poshmark is that every day we get to see the success of over 10 million people who are actively selling and buying on the platform and continue to scale. And we have women who have gone from sort of starting from their closets now running million dollar businesses, managing three or four fashion brands entirely on, on Poshmark. We've heard stories of people escaping abusive relationships using Poshmark. We've heard people who have started again uh, and, and built you know, a multi sort of city group and then of course connections. So that is fantastic. And the fact that we don't have to go and give them another tax bill at the end of the day, is very, very nice because they can continue to scale their business around Poshmark. And so that focus has been the key. The final thing I'm gonna leave with you, which is a super important thing is, each of you is weird. Who doesn't feel that they're, or who feels that they're weird? <laughs> right? Starting from Intel and doing, helping women sell shoes, definitely weird, right? But there's many other weirdnesses I can talk about. I'll tell you one thing else is that the very first year I arrived in this country, I was actually nine months later performing on the steps of the Texas State Capitol, a Mexican folk dance being part of the Mexican folk dancing group. So totally embrace your weirdness. And in your weirdness, you're also embracing everyone else's weirdness. And that's the power. The power is not about you. It's really about accepting everyone else for who they are. And in that process, you can create something much more robust. So when you think of our community and think of the products they sell, and there's many platforms out there, one of the biggest things for us is that fashion is universal. So there's no restriction to what you can sell on Poshmark. You can sell your $5 shirts and you can sell your $5,000 handbag. You can sell something new, you can sell something old. You can sell high end, low end. And really by embracing everyone, what it does is it creates much more robust of a system. And you'd be surprised even if you look around or you look at your closet or around, what you find is that people have all kinds of mixtures and they actually go through all kinds of journeys. And by bringing it all together and figuring out a way to have them all work together, it's become so much more robust than if we created a platform only for a certain kind of product, whether it was luxury or street or something. And now we can actually start to broaden it up and embrace all other kinds of weirdnesses. Similarly in our company, when I look around and we look at different people, we have PhDs, we have folks from Ivy Leagues and we have college dropouts and they're all in senior positions in different kinds of senior positions because we want to and embrace it all. And, and you're working hard. I mean, I wouldn't say that we are all completely diverse. We have to work more on that diversity within the company, but the key and the mindset is open so that, and through that you can create a lot more robustness. So by embracing your weirdness, I would really urge you to embrace the weirdness of all of the others and through that, I think you can create something much, much more robust. Thank you. <laughs>